Welcome everybody to the Gecko Pod, episode 46. We are a podcast for the Gecko community where we talk about breeding geckos as a hobby and as a business. My name is Harry at Zero's Geckos. We have AJ, AJD Reptiles, and today we have the awesome Nicoletta from Giuliani's Geckos. Um, how are you doing, Nicoletta? I'm great. Excited to be here. Good to have you here. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for, thanks for hanging out with us. We really appreciate you. We know you're busy, so... No, this is awesome. Yeah. Um, you, AJ and, you, and Nicoletta, have you guys known each other for a long time or more? We, within the recent we years? officially met <laughs> at Florafauna two years okay. ago. Yeah. When the it first, started. Yeah. The first Florafauna. I had known okay. of um, your business before that, but we hadn't met or really talked too much. Oh, so. that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew who you were too. So, yeah. Wow. That, that first Florafauna, I got to meet a lot of really cool people. That was awesome. Yeah, that was that was a special one because it was like so many of those people had never met. And then we all collided in at the first floor of fauna, which was just like, I don't know, just so different than anything else I'd ever experienced before. Yeah, it was so, so much fun. I can't wait to go back. I missed the last one. So I'm looking I know, forward to the did. third one. Uh, <laughs> you were there in spirit. I felt I it. I was, yeah. <laughs> next, time, think, well, next time I'll have the baby with me. It'll be fun. Oh, yay. <laughs> Will you be uh, planning on vending uh, for a while at Florifana, Nicoletta? Did you really enjoy it the last two? I two mean, years? I'll be there as long as I can be. Cool. I mean, I kind of, I like they book it so far in advance that I don't yeah. really have a choice but to be there. But I mean, obviously, <laughs> if something comes up. But no, I'm a long-term Florifana. Sweet. Nice. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's I still awesome. have your lanyard from this, it's, this past year. It's the one that's spelled wrong, so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. We have the same one, Harry. <laughs> yeah. the colors are awesome. Now. They're all gone now. I will have new ones that are spelled correctly. <laughs> you got to spell them wrong again, but just in a different way. I, I, Switch yeah. one of the letters. Put it with I'm a like, J instead of a G. Yeah, I'm just glad it wasn't the name. It was just the Instagram because. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so Nicoletta, where are you located? Where's Nicoletta? I, yeah, Nicoletta? I'm in Northern Colorado. Um, I'm okay. in Greeley, actually, which is like, cool. it's an Eastern East. It's, it's farther East um, than the mountains, but yeah, Northeast mm. here where we are kind of farm town out here. Gotcha. Yeah. Did you grow up there as well in Colorado? Yeah, I was born in Fort Collins, so. We okay. just we just kept moving east. So we're about 45 minutes east of Fort Collins now. Okay. Which is about an hour north of Denver. So nice. Yeah. I've been That's here good. forever. Yeah. Have you been in the reptile hobby very often? I know you have a, an interesting origin story. We'd we'd love to hear about it. But when did you start reptiles yeah. moving into um geckos, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my very first pet was an African fat tail gecko. Yeah, nice. Named yeah. Dinger after the Colorado Rockies mascot <laughs> um, <laughs> when I was three. So, that, oh, wow. Yeah, my yeah, my very first pet. I've been obsessed with animals my entire life. I mean, if you talk to my parents or all of my friends growing up, I mean, I was out catching every animal I could, rescuing every animal I could, begging my parents to buy me every pet <laughs> that they would. So, I mean, as far as, you know, the reptile hobby goes, I've owned reptiles my entire life. I went from and my parents, they weren't into reptiles, but they supported me. But I had my African fat tail gecko. I had a ball python and mm -hmm. a bearded dragon as a kid and then a ton of other animals. But um, so, you know, for as long as I can remember, I've had some kind of reptile in my life. And then into my adulthood, you know, college, things like that. You can't really take a lot of that stuff with yeah. you. Um, my parents weren't super up for for keeping them. So <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> I let a lot of that go, including my horses. I grew up showing horses. Mm, so okay. yeah, college was a pretty, you know, pivotal time for me. I let go of most of my pets, to be honest. Um, mm. And it wasn't until I got married and had my boys that I kind of got back into the reptiles. And I, I, I make the joke now because my boys, they, they like them. They don't really care that much, but I make the joke that I bought a pet gecko for my son, but it was really for myself. Um, and that's kind of, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what landed me. What I did too. That. Yeah. You're uh, living vicariously through your son. You're pretty like, much. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I made it, you know, all about him, but really it was for me. And then it just, from there, it just kind of escalated into more animals. And, you know, I bought him a leopard gecko. I think it was for his third birthday. I have to, 
I'd have to look back. It was a second or third birthday, far too young to own a leopard. Gecko. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, and we actually, I still have that leopard gecko. His name is Cole. That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah. And you know, I'll get more into that in a minute, but yeah. with all the projects that I have going on, you know, Cole is actually breeding and it's really fun because he's kind of, we call him the OG in the family and my husband resents <laughs> him heartily because he started it all. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as far as kind of being in the hobby, really in the last five years is when I've gotten into breeding and especially breeding the high end animals, um, which is kind of a unique story as to how that evolved, um, mm. you know, as far as my personal story goes. And I don't know if you want me to get into that, but yeah, um, yeah. Love, okay. Love yeah. So if you yeah. share it. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, we had Cole and then we had um, then we got a bearded dragon. Then I had to have more bearded dragons. And so I really kind of started off my breeding experience with bearded dragons. Um, mm. And that was really fun because I love, I just love bearded dragon personalities. So at the time um, I went to college for health and exercise science, sports medicine, and got into the fitness industry and became a functional nutritionist. And when I was 26, I opened my own gym oh, and wow. that was here in Northern Colorado. Um, I had an 8,000 square foot facility and multiple trainers. I was living my dream. I mean, that was my baby. It was all yeah. I ever, you know, wanted and knew. What, and was it like a CrossFit gym? It was not CrossFit, but functional okay. fitness. So, you know, we oh, had different fitness. modalities okay. of, of, you know, classes and things like that. Um, mostly mm -hmm. classes and, you know, but we were not technically CrossFit. We did have a powerlifting team, but got it. Not. Yeah. Wow. But yeah. That's so, cool. um, and, and um, let's see, 2018, um, my grandfather became ill mm -hmm. and he's my best mm -hmm. friend, like in the entire world. And so while I'm running my gym, doing everything, I decided that I was going to be his full-time care provider. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was a decision that I didn't take lightly, but it did take a huge toll on our family. And he mm -hmm. was, he was my best friend. So 2019, the end of 2019, he passed away mm. and it was a really challenging time, but, um, yeah, I mean, all I can say about that is when he passed away, I did inherit some money from him. And in that season, I kind of just kind of packed it away and was like, I don't know what I want to do with this and don't really want to put more money into my gym. I really <laughs> loved it, but you know, it was kind of like what I needed and lo and behold, 2020 hit and COVID. So mm. the gym. everything was pretty much flipped upside down. Uh, um, yeah. You know, anybody who owned a business during COVID understands like just <clears throat> the direct impact it takes on your family. And it was tough. And mm. at the time, I had all these animals, these reptiles I was feeding. Um, cause at that point I'd already gotten crested geckos. I had more, <laughs> I, did, I forgot, wow. <laughs> but I had a lot more reptiles at the time that COVID hit and I was driving into scales and tails Fort Collins while my gym was closed and all my trainers are out of a job, you know, everything, just things slips up, you know, but scales and tails was open because they were deemed necessary because people had to feed their animals. And so I was going in there and buying feeders every single week for my reptiles, which thank God, you know, <clears> that was available to me. But from a business standpoint, um, it really irritated me. I was like, how is my gym closed right now? And I'm able to go and shop at Scales and Tails. It was just kind of one of those things. And <laughs> so I, you know, as a business minded person, I said, you know what? I see this niche here. This is a pretty interesting niche. And out in my area, we don't have anything like it. So I took that money and I opened a pet store. Wow. And I sold my That's, gym. This is this is 2020. This is 2020. Yeah. Yep. And in the meantime, I was spending so much money on geckos. It's not even funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, how many how many geckos? Just to give us an idea, how many geckos were you at right around so, when the gym closed and when you're about to start a pet store? I started I started buying super soft scales from AC. Uh, okay. End of 2018 okay. into 2019 into 2020. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, and other breeders, not just him, but, um, so at that point when I started the pet store, you know, I was in pretty deep with my own collection and wanted to cap capitalize on 
the feeders and the supplies from a business standpoint. And, you know, just saw a niche in, in, in that area for me. So as far as the amount of animals I had, you know, I want to say probably, you know, if we're talking gecko specific for my, you know, which my passion project was the crested geckos. I want to say probably had maybe 50 at that time, not a, not a huge amount, but enough to be, you know, enough to be significant. Um, 50 breeders you're talking about. No, I, cause I, you know, I bought a lot of, I bought a lot of nice stuff that was juvenile too. So, you know, it it. it definitely wasn't 50 breeders. And I mean, when I got into it, and I mean, you guys probably know this, a Lily White was $4,000, $5,000 for a breeder. <laughs> and, um, you know, I paid still, three for one. <laughs> yeah, it was, I mean, yeah. I paid a pretty penny for every breeder I have in my collection. And, and yeah. I bought when the market was high. Yes. And, yeah. uh-huh. you know, so it's diff- a little bit different now. And that's neither here nor there. But at the time, you know, I was just collecting as much of the nice stuff as I could afford, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. Um, that fit within what I wanted to do with my projects. So middle of 2020, uh, 2020 um, we opened during a pandemic. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, <laughs> I wasn't. So I opened my exotic pet shop in Greeley and hired the guy from Scales and Tails, which is still my manager, my right-hand man now. Um, and he's amazing. So I ran the, the storefront for three years. So we just wow. actually... Um, in April of this year, we decided to not sign our lease and we took mm. everything online. So okay. oh. we no longer have the storefront now. We just have the breeding facility where we operate online and in in person at expos. So that's a completely different side of my business. It's actually a separate business. Oh. There's a little extra business plug, but um and which yeah, what is, is what's wild, the name? What's the it's name called of it? Wild Things Exotic Pets. Wild Things it does, is your website still up? It is. Yep. Okay, and we, have, we have an Instagram too. Okay. Um, and I have my manager and um, I mean, she's an employee, but she's a close friend at this point. And they do all the breeding and care for pretty much everything else in my breeding facility now. So what all do you guys breed there for, for this business? Like, what do you yeah, guys mainly good. focus on? Yeah. So um, let's see. Sienna's got all the leopard geckos. She's got all the desert, the desert gecko species going. She's got leopard geckos, cave geckos. Um, she's got knobtail geckos going. Nice. And then, um, you know, sh- her and Mike kind of both do the bearded dragons. We have all kinds of snakes. We got retics, ball pythons, mm-hmm. boas. Um, my passion project outside of the geckos is the Asian water monitors. So we have a pretty solid project with the Asian waters as well. These are cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're amazing. That's awesome. So lots of other side things going on, which, um, you know, my manager, Mike, who's been with me since day one, he's actually starting in 2024. Um, that business will become his, which I'm super proud of him. And, and it's going to be an awesome, awesome transition for us. Mm. Um, we'll still be in the same facility and everything like that, but you know, he deserves it. He's worked his butt off and um, we have some really awesome projects, but he, he heads all of those up. I'm there to support, uh, you know, we yeah. do a lot of um, birthday parties, events, things like that, which is awesome. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. You know, it was interesting. Um, Nicoletta, when, when I asked you for your email and then it was to another thing, I, I was kind of confused. Oh, well, now <laughs> you like, know. Wild things. <laughs> wild oh, things. What's this? It makes yeah. sense now. It's, uh, yeah, I it's mean, they're, other they're, two, yeah. they're two separate things under one roof. And the whole idea behind it was when I had the pet store, you know, that was a storefront. It was different, different, you know, visions, okay. different goals. And, and oh, what yeah. it came down to was, you know, the business survived off of feeder sales and all of us oh. were more passionate about the animals. So yeah. when I made that choice, it was like, Hey guys, do you want to focus on feeders? Do you want to focus on animals? Cause we got to get rid of the overhead if we're going to focus on the animals. So got it. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so is it is this co-owned? Is that so technically it's owned by me, but my manager okay. Mike has has worked his way into some equity and there's gonna be some transfers and fun things okay. um for that's him. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's, no, cool. that's very cool. Yeah, that yeah. that makes sense now. Um yeah. Yeah, it's good to kind of hear kind of your journey of that. Yeah. And, but in the while you had wild things, you also had Juliana's geckos. Yep. Um as your side uh kind of side business as well. Yes. For yourself. Yep. 
that and those, the geckos have always been at home with me that's kind of just been my uh, side okay. thing and okay. my passion project now everything's here at my house um we have a, an outbuilding that you know all of our animals are in which has been really fun to have everything under one roof now um yeah. but yeah the, the 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 geckos has been my my passion project since day one aside from you know the pet store <clears throat> So do you have all the animals for wild things and your geckos in one building? Yep. We have a big, like, I think, eh, I don't know the square footage, but we have a big shop. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. Was that already on your property or did you build it from scratch? So we moved two years ago and it was on the property and my oh, husband, nice. yeah, my husband, um, when we moved into this house would have died if I would have told him two years later, that thing would be full of animals. <laughs> but uh, Now it is. So yeah, no, it actually worked out really well. I think it was meant to be because everything's housed in there. Great. We have plenty of space and um, it works out really well. It's heated That's and good. cooled and you know, all the good stuff. Yeah. Nice. You have a good was, team. That, was that already set up? Like all the HVAC and all that I insulation? Did to, I did have to put the, the air conditioner in. we had heat in there, but we didn't have okay. the AC. Yeah. So okay. I did have to put that in, but nice. Yeah. And it's hard in Colorado because you know, the weather is always up and down here in Colorado. Mm, yeah. We have no humidity whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> That's rough. That's yeah. crazy. I'll ask you about that more later when we're talking about husbandry and stuff. I'm, I'm interested yeah. to hear about that. For sure. <laughs> um, Nicholas. So how, how big is your collection of crested themselves currently? Oh man. Let's see. So too big, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I need to refine and downsize. Um, I've held a lot back. Um, okay. Pretty much 90% of my stuff from the last three years I've held back, wow. especially in the soft scale, super soft scale projects, mm. um, mainly because I needed to see how things are working for myself. Um, yeah. And that's been really beneficial to me. And I'm thankful I did that. I would say probably right now going into the 2024 season, if I don't do some downsizing, I've probably, I've, I've probably got a hundred breeding females mm, Okay. Um, and, you know, probably too many males in there. And then as far as babies and juveniles, you know, quite honestly, it's a lot. I would say if I were to count, I'm probably close to three or 400. Okay. Right. Geckos. I, I also breed gargoyle geckos and Europlatus species and getting into the, Euro, is, you say Eurodactyloides. Everyone's yep. different. <laughs> So I, yeah, Yuri's. I do have three pairs of those for next season, which I'm super Sweet. excited about. Nice. Um, I hatched nice. lychees out this year for the first time, and yeah, none nice. of them are going anywhere. <laughs> <There's> no <laughs> um, so yeah, as far as crested geckos go, that's I'm probably at that 300 mark or so, maybe a little okay. bit more. Nice. Okay. Yeah. That's still that's still manageable, believe it or not. <laughs> well, and I have help. I mean, I I. I don't know how people manage that size of a collection without some bit of help, you know, and it's, it's not the breeders, it's the hatchlings. It's yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the, the for sure. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And everything grows so fast and you're like, Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Are you keeping stuff? Uh, do you have lids or do you have shoebox racks like rack systems? So we have rack systems for all of our snakes and I've thought multiple times about biting the bullet to get the rack systems for the geckos. And I really need to, but I think for me, it's just more of like not wanting to spend the money at the moment on that. Yeah. Um, I did just buy a bunch of beautiful um, PVC cages for my breeders. And that was a little bit more of a higher priority. Um, yeah. And that's expensive to convert. Yeah. And it Especially was. adults. Yeah. Like adults is crazy expensive to convert. Yeah. And we have a lot of glass for adults, which I love. I, you mm. know, as long as it's front opening, I love it. So thankfully I don't have a ton of adults and anything else besides glass or those PVC, but on, you know, on a wish list, I would love to get the rack systems. I do have grow out um, rack systems um, mm. with the bigger tubs and I love them. Um, and I actually, they were supposed to be for arboreal snakes and we don't breed any of those. So I just converted them into using them for the geckos. And it does save a lot of time, not taking lids on and off it, you yeah. know, it really is cumbersome when you take every single lid off, but eventually, yeah. Yeah, eventually. I would love it that. Will it will change your life when you do it. <laughs> I know. I know. Keep telling me that. As long as you have help, it's okay. Just make them do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't let my help touch the babies. Isn't that horrible? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, um, I have to check every baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm like that too. I'm like, some tasks I'll have Abby, my employee, help me with. And then others, I'm like, I just have to do these myself. 
Yep. I know. I know. And plus, the way I, it is. I think you just want to look at all of them every day and it's this excuse. Yeah. I mean, for me, it is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, Nicoletta, we're talking about tangerines. There's several people that asked about your tangerines. <laughs> so uh, I love that. Let me, pull, let me pull up a couple of questions. These are from Instagram. It's from Lilac Exotics. When did she first come in contact with tangerine? Who did she get it from? I want to know about her tangerine project, what future vision she has for it. And then um, a, more of a longer form question, which we'll, we'll dive into in a second. But uh, basically, I would love to hear her work with the tangerines. And so um, cool. starting off, how, uh, how would you define a tangerine? What is it? Oh, my for goodness. I don't know. So here's this is a big, I would say, question I ask myself often because I love tangerines. Um, maybe probably one of my favorites, to be honest, if you can't see on my Instagram, I feel like I'm posting my tangerines often because I gravitate towards them when I want to videotape something. Um, and I feel like this, the tough part for me with the tangerines is that there's so many different varieties of tangerines mm -hmm. and how different people define a tangerine. For me, it really is just, I think the base color changing the pigment but looking at tangerines, I've had people send me messages like, look at this beautiful tangerine. And I'm like, that is beautiful, but that's orange. That's not tangerine. Mm. And so to me, to me, right? So yeah. if I sent mm. you that picture, Harry, you might be like, oh, that that's tangerine. So I think that's the hardest part for me right now is kind of just differentiating what is tangerine as far as what we see, the visual tangerine side of it. Um, yeah. You know, to me, that is very much a tangerine gecko. Yeah, It's hard to even see the strong tangerine pigments on that in the video. Is if it, you see that gecko in person, it's unbelievable. Yeah. How, how do tangerines just, form about? I, I don't know. Maybe there's a question for AJ too. But where, where did tangerines originate from? I mean, I, I think mean, the, na the naming is from AC. Okay. The, yeah, the naming is from AC. And then, you know, I feel like I followed fringe morphs tangerines for a long time okay. also, um, which I feel like strongly differed mm -hmm. from AC's lines of tangerines. I, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know where they originated from. AJ, you might know that. I don't, I don't know on fringe morphs. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah but, sure, I, yeah. but I asked, you know, I, I kind of dove into it a little bit with the guys at fringe morphs, morphs asking like, hey, like, where did this come from? And, you know, they they didn't necessarily have um, as much lineage for me to look at. And maybe, you know, that was neither here nor there, but my tangerine lines originated from AC 1000%. Okay. And then I started exactly. buying tangerines that I was seeing from other people, um, including fringe morphs. Cause I think their stuff is sick, but it's different. Yeah. It's very, very different. Hmm. So, and then combining, combining the different, different tangerines and then seeing what they do with other, you know, for me, the best tangerines come from a super soft scale. Mm. How would you, so how would you say the AC and the fringe morph tangerines differ? How would you characterize one versus the other? Yeah, for sure. So AC and this, I don't know if this will be a good, good way to describe it. Hopefully it makes sense to you guys. In my mind, AC's line of tangerines, it's sharp. It's intense. It's very bright. Um, and it's very in your face. Fringe morphs tangerine is soft. It's subtle. Um, now Odin, that's different. That's, uh, you know, I haven't seen that gecko in, per in person, but the tangerines I'm working with and producing out of fringe morphs lines, they're, they're just a softer appearance. It's equally mm -hmm. as beautiful, um, but not nearly as vibrant and kind of punch you in the face tangerine as AC lines. Got mm -hmm. it. So would you, would you think that it's the same gene or a different gene? I, mm, that's a tough question. I personally, or, or is it a gene? <laughs> that's, yeah, so <laughs> that's the, that's the million dollar question. Um, and I had a little bit of a conversation with this about this with one of my employees today. Um, mm. because I do think that is, that is the million dollar question that everyone's mm. asking. And I, I personally, in my own collection, don't have enough information that I am putting together for myself to say whether or not it's a gene or whether it's just a bunch of, you know, stacking. And mm. I laugh because I'm like, I have projects where I have beautiful tangerines that I'm just throwing together to make more beautiful tangerines. And then I have mm. projects where I have these unbelievable, I don't know, you might be able to pull this up um, on my Instagram, but I do have a gecko Paloma. 
um, yeah, and her siblings. It. I think I posted her somewhat recently. Okay. Um, let's see. You see it here? Yep, that's her right there. Right yeah. there in the middle. Yep, that's her. So she comes from AC's Pink Lines. And she was combined with a gecko that has tangerine pigments, actually not even related to fringe morphs lines. And they throw these crazy pink, beautiful tangerine mm. geckos. So I'm seeing a little bit of evidence of both if you're, if, you know, but I, I wish I had like more of a genetic backbone to say it's one or the other. Hmm. Um, but I am making unbelievable tangerine geckos hmm. with a subpar tangerine to something else. So Harry, it's could you maybe pu could you maybe pull up foundation genetics so we can just see what Anthony describes yeah. tangerine as? I'm curious yeah. because I I'll be honest, it's never been like I've never been I think probably because my color blindness, it's never been like it never really did anything for me, but I just don't think I can see them. Um Yeah, you but, definitely can't, AJ. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can. So because of that, I haven't really researched them that much. So, and I do, I did actually talk to Anthony from Little Monsters today. Um, he's awesome, and I, I don't, I haven't read his information on it, but with talking to him, it sounds like he thinks it's a genetic thing going on for sure. Mm, yeah, I'm sure he has it in there, Harry. If you just pull yeah, up like the key, try to, trying to pull it up here. Hold on, let me pull you guys so you guys can watch me fumble around for it. Yeah, just <laughs> where, just where go to that at? articles and then. I is think it one or one, two? Let's see. It's probably two. Oh, two. Okay. I bet if it's in two, you do the traits, traits? and then you find oh, you tangerine down here. Oh, here it goes. Oops. Oh, oh empty two. back are my favorite. <laughs> Where'd it go? How come it shot shot over? Try it again. Okay. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what does he say? Stock, huh? Oh, no. Well, that's what. That? That's what all this stuff uh, goes back to. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Bye, guys. We'll get back. We'll get it. We'll find it. We'll find it. <laughs> all right. Here we go. All right. Cool. Okay. So incomplete That's dominant. Great. So if it's incomplete dominant, then is there tangerine and super tangerine? Or how would it be labeled? Would it be labeled het tangerine and visual tangerine? With the het not being obvious? High white pattern animals receive a yellow hue. Okay. And some yeah, with pink know. coloration. Okay. Uh, hyper to hyper. So they, they would say, so that's how they would do it. Tangerine or hyper tangerine. So hyper would be the super form. Or the two, mm -hmm. copy, the two copy gene version would be hyper. So they'd be functioning the same way that soft scale is where there's one copy gene, soft scale, two copies, super soft scale. Mm -hmm. So yeah, same way. All right. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's kind of just like soft scale and tangerine. I think there's still a lot to be discovered when you're starting to cross things into other projects and, and kind of see what they do. I mean, I forgot what that second question was, Harry. I don't know oh. if I, we got to uh, it. Yeah. <clears throat> there's a yeah there's one is it more of a line bread trait or stack we kind of mentioned that um is is she using tangerines to uh orange pattern or white pattern and yeah what i guess we'll ask what are you using tangerine with right now like what's your game plan as far as what things you're what projects you're breeding it into what's your vision for the future with it is yeah absolutely um so to answer that question, I'm kind of moving it into both orange pattern and and the the white pattern animals to see what it does. Um, originally, I was pretty obsessed with the white walls and what it does mm. to the white walls um, mm. because it, I just love that look of that thick, you know, thick pattern on the side being all tangerine. And then, you know, you add empty back and, and things like that into it. I think it's you, super unique. And originally, I really liked the tangerine against the dark base. And then I started moving it into some other projects, seeing what it does with lavender. And when you mix it into those lighter colored animals and or hypos, the white patterns, things like that, it softens it up, but makes it more pink. So it's like I said, you go back to these different variations of what the tangerine looks like based on 
what projects you're working it into. So, you know, for me, my main projects right now with the tangerine um, is really moving into that crazy tangerine white wall look. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. Everything's always super soft scale, soft scale for me. So yeah. all of my tangerine pro projects are, are in that wavelength. Um, but moving some of fringe morphs lines into that has been fun and unique and interesting. Um, mm. just to see what that combination does to see if it changes anything. Um, and then over time I would, you know, I would ideally like to see how it works with the lilies. And that's why for me, I'm working on nice super soft scale lily projects. So significantly, you know, into that, because I want to see when you cross, these crazy super soft scale tangerines into a super soft scale lily, what the heck happens there? Okay. So you're still know. trying to figure out how the lily affects uh, the uh, t tangerines, which is this person's question as well. Right. When uh, you mix okay. that in, when you mix that into the super soft scales, I mean, we've seen some insane, insane yeah. tangerine lily whites, mm -hmm. um, mm. you know, from different breeders. I, I think, oh gosh, I'm not, I'm going to, I want to, I want to call him out right now because some <laughs> of his animals. His I think his Instagram is sus suspenseful Steve. He's kind of like under the radar with the geckos. Pull him up. Um, <laughs> but, so yeah, and not to say that there's not a ton of other people um, oh, yeah. working with you know the tangerine lilies, but you've got to see this guy's lilies. They're like okay. sure. crazy. I love them. And let's see these things. Let's see if we can pull it up. You might have We're to. That's a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> that oh, frog. Yeah, JJ. <laughs> there, there's oh. one right there. Click on that. Oh, it's a cute, cute dark frogs. Oh. Okay, wait. This one? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's kind of cool. They're like uh, really. They almost look. Lily. They almost look dirty. <laughs> you are colorblind. <laughs> but you know what I mean. It's almost like yeah. I mean, yeah. I like it. It's cool. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, but it's different. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, it's, that's cool. It's cool. intriguing for sure. And I, but you know, <coughs> sorry. I like those. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, he's got some other ones on there too. You can see he's got, he's definitely got some cool tangerine stuff working in his projects. I Is don't that know. Steve what right there? I would assume. Up, Steve? Steve doesn't follow <laughs> us, but what's up, Steve? Steve's on a podcast, doesn't even know. <laughs> yeah, he will. I'll tag him. Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah, oh, cool. there you can see. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's, that's cool, kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So just kind of, you know, looking at the lily whites, it's obviously doing something. Yeah. To the lily yeah, whites. that's cool. That's very interesting. I like that. But yeah, I, I want to move, I want to move into what, the, you know, what that's going to look like more for the lily whites when you have that super soft scale gene at play, which some of these geckos might mm -hmm. have that. I don't know. Did you, um, so did you, are you working on that this past season? Did you have a bunch of lily white tangerines? No. So unfortunately it's taking me till this season actually to have okay. a ready to breed super soft scale Lily. So, mm. um, so that's a little bit of a slower, slower going project this year. Actually it was 2022. I believe I produced six or seven super soft scale lilies. Okay. So 2025 is going to be my big year to see kind of how that all pans out. I do have my, one of my super soft scale lilies paired up right now. Um, and she's the only one that I have from, from the 2000, yeah. was it 2021? So. Wow. Yeah, they're cool. We'll That's see cool. how that pans out. Like yeah. It. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Super cool. Very tangerine. -y. I can't I like appreciate it. them as much as I should, but <laughs> I can <laughs> tell they, I can tell they look what different. At? <laughs> and like I said, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what his lines are, where they come from and, you know, mm. might be something worth reaching out to him if he's willing to kind of give that information out. But for me with the tangerines, it all started with how can I make the brightest, most vibrant animal against the darkest yeah. face? You know, yeah. I just, that's, cool. that's kind of where does, I um, gravitated the, towards. Sorry. Does, uh, does Halloween at all play into tangerine stuff or is it completely different? For me, I, I keep all of the Halloween stuff away from the tangerine stuff. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. It's just come something separate. Got it. Yeah. For me, I mean, that's like, like I said, the Halloween stuff that to me is orange. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and then when I, when I look at my, my best tangerine pairings, it's not tangerine to orange. Ah, uh, okay. It's tangerine to white. It's ta it's tangerine to white or it's tangerine to yellow. Oh, okay. My best pairings um have yellow 
Um, for me, yeah, I just kind of stay away from tangerine to orange personally. I just think it, I just think it turns orange. I think it takes away from it. And then when you go to the lighter based animals, lavenders, hypos, the white pattern stuff, you're going to get that the more pink, the pink tangerine. You're going to yeah. get, you know, a little bit more of that coloration when you add that in, but I like to separate and I, and I, it's funny because Halloween's that's what I was first. When I first got into like the high end stuff, I saw a super soft scale Halloween on AC site. And I was like, I have to have that gecko. <laughs> Isn't and I cool? still have her and ah. she's amazing. Actually, I named her Juliana. She's that amazing. <laughs> um, cool. But she's ha a Halloween and she's orange and she does a lot of really cool things to the Lily Whites. I have a couple of her Lily kids um, <laughs> and does a lot of really cool things with lavender base. But I have, you know, I just every time I've done tangerine with that orange, you know, the bright orange stuff, it just kind of just orange. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, good that's to know. Cool. This is all new to me. <laughs> yeah. We're learning. We're learning right now. Yeah, no, that's yeah, cool. it is really cool. Because if you look at them separately, this uh, a normal lily white and then a tangerine, it's like it's different. It's very cool. Sure. I like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It really is. It gives then, a lot of variety to it. Yeah. And then if you look at so like the gecko that I posted today, uh -huh. um, she comes from lavender lines. And I love how that tangerine looks. You can see her. She's fired down here. Yeah. Um, but it's more subtle. <clears throat> it's more pink-esque against the lavender base if you see it in person, as opposed to that that original baby I showed you who has that dark base and that tangerine just, yeah. you know. Does, so the super soft, uh, does it make the tangerine pop more? Super soft makes everything pop more. Okay. <laughs> yeah. it, help, it helps everything, I think. Yeah. I mean, it... Yeah. I, people ask me all the time, they're like, you know, what does it do? I said, it cleans everything up. I, you know, I think everything is beautiful, but when you add that super soft scale into it, or, you know, you get that soft skill, you know, even, yeah. even high white stuff that you're working with AJ, like some of the, the projects that I have going with the soft skills and the high white stuff, it's amazing to see, you know, some of, some of what it's doing to those yeah. different projects as well. I just think it cleans everything up. Yeah. Um, so do you I, have super soft in, uh, most of your projects in everything yeah okay. <laughs> um yeah. i i want to say this year there was only two you know some of my super dalmatian projects my ink spot projects they don't have any soft scale lineage in them but then i have some that do so i'm really trying to you know work that in more i do have some possible super soft scale <laughs> um super dals this year that have been nice. hatched out which is really fun he doesn't have any soft scale lineage but i love mm. ink spots I want yeah. to see what happens when I mix that in with super soft scale and what it does. You know, I know for the red base, that's where my super soft scale dial projects are this year. Yeah. Um, it's really cool to see what it's doing. Um, Is there again, any yellow based super soft scale dials? Um, not that I've gotten my hands on. And if I did, I would grab it up in a heartbeat, especially yeah, I've never seen one. Base. Yeah. Yellow I mean, I've base. seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of yellow line patterns stuff. Um, yeah. that are super soft scale, not but phantom. I, yeah. I've not seen much phantom. Um, you know, I bought, it's funny. I bought a soft scale <laughs> phantom Lily from Dan, um, at Gecko Harmony, which he's one of my besties, one of my crusty besties. Yay. <laughs> yeah, um, he's awesome. This, yeah, this folio is, this folio is from Dan, by the way. Oh, that's awesome. I, I bought it used from Dan. Yeah, him. that's great. That no, he's, he's the best. But I did get a phantom, a yellow phantom lily Dalmatian from him at Florifauna this last year. And I'm so oh, wow. excited about her. I mean, and she came from some really cool projects of his. I haven't posted her, I don't think. Um, I will, though, now that I mention that, um, because she's, she's going to kind of lead into a project that I have. Um, do you guys follow New Day? Lauren and Brandon. I don't think I, don't I, do. I no. do. Let me see. Okay. They're awesome. You know, when I first got started, they helped me a lot with kind of developing some things and they have some sick tangerine lilies they're hatching out. So if you don't follow them, you absolutely should. Time to follow. Uh, yeah. If you scroll I down, I think she's yeah. got, so Tango, she's got a super soft scale male breeding this year. Um, and he's got some offspring. If you go down just a little bit farther. She's been posting a lot lately because they're letting go of breeders, but you can see uh, some of these tangerine babies oh, look at this here. One. Yeah. What is this? Wow. 
Is this Tangerine Lily? Yep. Oh, wow. And possible Super Soft, I believe. Yeah, that's, that's cool. pretty. So they have some really cool stuff. Um, but what I was going to say was I got a Phantom Doll um, Lily from them a long time ago and paired her with a Super Soft Scale. So I've got Soft Scale Phantom Lily Dalmatians. So that's a super <laughs> fun project. Soft <laughs> Scale. Mm -hmm. um, and are they yellow or red? Th those ones are red. Okay. Those ones are red. That's why I was so excited about Dan's because I wanted that yellow. <laughs> Yeah, but I no, have yeah. I have soft scale phantoms, but they're all red. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen the uh, sangria? My super soft scale. Is it on your page? Yeah. Let's see it. Uh, you can't miss her. Reds is my other love, y'all. Okay. Oh, you got you got <laughs> some nice handsome red lilies. Right that's now. if you scroll down, there's a there's a video of her somewhere on here. Yeah. Not that one. That's one. That one's from Dan, actually. He's sick too. Oh, I nice. got him at Flora Fauna last year. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a nice one. He's a soft these, scale. These red phantoms. Um, so if you scroll down a little ways, she might be uh -huh. kind of a little ways down there. Um, that guy's Mac. When we get to the 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 question okay. of the heads, keep going, keep going. <laughs> I love that you have these pictures. That's actually so helpful for me to talk yeah. about things. So if you yeah. there's one right there, she's uh yeah. that that lioness here on the right. You can see she's that head empty back. This one uh possible super soft scale lily right there. Am I am I pressing yep, you're on her. she's okay. fancy? Yeah, that's Mine. pretty. That's cool. She's cool. I have a male that looks just like her. That's the same combo. Ooh, I wish we could breed them together. Mm. <laughs> Wait, we, why, why can't we? <laughs> you can ask know. that. People are going to get confused. That's super okay. super <laughs> lilies. Everybody likes those. New, new breeders will ask, like, can I breed this together? I'm like, no. <laughs> please don't. <laughs> no lily whites together, please. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, yeah. that's beautiful, though. Wow. That's, yeah, it's beautiful. I feel like we got off topic. I was showing yeah. you the right phantom <laughs> for soft scale. But... We're just looking at your collection now. <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Um, oh man. So fun. So super uh, soft. What I guess at this point, did you, did you start with a few super soft animals and then just like slowly like leak them into every project mm -hmm. or have you been like, did you buy one Harlequin, one red pinstripe, one, this, that were all super soft and then like slowly do it. Or do you just buy a bunch of adults and bring them together? So there was, I, I was talking to Anthony from Little Monsters about this today, actually. And there was like a, a whole year where anytime AC would post a super soft scale adult, I would buy it. It was just like, <laughs> like no one could get out. And that's how Dan from Gecko Harmony and I met because yeah. Anthony posted like five super soft scale females. And I went on and I bought all of them. And that's Dan funny. from Gecko Harmony was like, I just talked to AC and he told me you bought all of those geckos. Like I wanted one of them. And I'm like, sorry, bud, you snooze, you lose. And um, so I think for like a year and a half, I just, every super soft scale I could find from lines that I trusted. I mean, some other people that I bought from um, Lindsay Bandy Crested Cuties. She's got some really mm. cool soft and super soft scale projects. Um, so I bought some from her, Lauren and Brandon from New Day. Um, I'm trying to think AC. Um, I got some from Redline. I don't even know if he's around much, um, but I got mm. some of his lines. Oh, I know I'm missing someone and I'm probably going to offend them. <laughs> um, there's, there's more. Okay. There's more and yeah, they're there, equally as good. There's more and everyone who I've ever yeah. gotten super tops from. Um, so yeah, obviously Dan from Gecko Harmony, but for, you know, the first year and a half that I started buying high-end geckos, I just, every single super soft scale I found, I bought. And you bought, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then at that point, you know, some of them were breeders, some of them were juveniles. And I, I went on a wild goose chase for a soft scale lily white. And that, you know, when I first started, it just really wasn't a thing. At least if it mm. was, people weren't labeling it as such. And so I mm. had to do a lot more digging. I really wanted to get ahead of the game on that project. Um, because that was kind of my, I saw the lily white, I saw the super soft scales and like, I have to, I have to put them together. Like yeah. I got to see what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. But without a soft scale lily, it was a longer term project. So, you know, I went on a goose chase for that for a minute um, and found a couple, <laughs> thankfully. But now I have a lot, a lot more soft scales and now super yeah. soft scale lilies to pull from. And that's cool. Nice. 
That's and, awesome. You know, it's, it was funny. Dan, when I was looking for pixels, and I was looking at AC's website, and then uh, AC's like, "Oh, that one just sold." I was like, "Dan, oh, Dan." <laughs> so I messaged Dan. He bought like three in a row or something. I know. We yeah. He learned. He learned pixels. from. He learned from me sniping stuff up. That you know, yeah. he's got to. He's got to get in there. No, I. You know, I love Dan. We have a lot of cool projects that we're working on together, which is fun yeah. because, yeah. you know, we, we have similar lines, but a lot different at the same time, a, you know, AJ, I know you love the empty backs, Dan yeah. loves empty back. And it's so funny because I'll send him stuff and he'll be like, that's empty back. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, so what are you going to do with it? I'm like, I don't know. That's not what I'm focusing on. I'm like, this is what I'm doing. With it. Like, yeah. And, and I love empty backs. Don't get me wrong, but it just hasn't been my focus. So he's mm. held me a little more accountable to being like, oh, well maybe, you should think about that <laughs> diversity yeah. feedback version of whatever you're doing. And I'm like, okay, thank yeah. you. So we have different interests. And, <laughs> and speaking of pixel, you know, he's invested in some really cool genetics that I'll get to work with him on. Um, thankfully he bought them. I didn't have to know, <laughs> um, but you know, pixel he's got, he bought some sables, which I'm super excited to see what, nice. you know, what yeah. comes of that. And nice. he's stayed a little bit more on top of some of the newer genetic things that, you know, that are coming up that I, haven't not that i'm not interested in them at all that's not that's not it it's just i have such a singular focus and that's i'm kind of an all or nothing person and yeah uh, me too I'm like yeah too. so i'm trying not to to let myself branch out too much from what i've already got going on but i'm i'm very excited to see what he does with you know the super soft scales and those you know those two genetics that are more new yeah so you had mentioned other genes you mentioned like sable and pixel and all these different things what uh, things are you at this point maybe open to working with or just like door closed? I don't like that. Like, is there anything that's off limits or anything that maybe you just are not into as far as like the new, the new genes that are out, like Sable, Exanthic, More. Cap, Pixel, yeah, sure. all that stuff. Yeah. I, so I love fraps. Hmm. I don't have any in my collection. Um, I don't love caps. That's just because I gravitate towards really bright colors, that type mm. of a thing, you know, the browns, the the dark stuff. Although Janine at Treehouse, I mean, you can't not love the stuff that she has. Yeah. Like, I look seriously. at her page just like, you know, that's unreal. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I I tend to stay away from the darker animals um in that sense, but I love the fraps and I would love to see um, you know, how the fraps get intermingled with super soft scale. Cause I'd love to see a soft scale and a super soft scale frap. I think that's going to be really mm. cool. Um, I have a couple animals out on loans to make fraps. So I think they oh, nice. I think did a couple this year um, just to kind of, you know, mix it up. Yeah. Yeah. Mix it up a little bit. I wouldn't say it's off limits. I'm definitely intrigued by it for sure. I, yeah. what I really want is to have a surplus <laughs> of super soft scale lilies to then say, Hey, let's go make a bunch of soft scale fraps and have it be super simple, you know, yeah. or vice versa, have, you know, what I want from the super soft skills to mix in with the fraps. I think that combination is going to be really cool. I know a few people are already doing it. Um, Exanthics, you know, I love them for what they are. I think they're very cool. Um, actually, Josh from Jerk. Yep. Yep. Him and I had a pretty solid conversation last year at Florafauna, and he's got some really cool soft scale exanthic stuff mm. that I think yeah. is, you know, when he gets a handle on that and is ready to let stuff go, I, I, you know, I, I probably would jump on that. Um, mm. My I phantom from Josh. Shout out to Josh. Yes, <laughs> yeah, my, you're exanthic. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I yeah. Mine's from that. Josh too. So I got to yeah. see, I got to make sure mine's not yeah. soft scale. <laughs> yeah, you better check it out. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I, I don't even I, know. I can't even tell if it's soft scale. I, I'm that much of a soft scale noob. I don't even know. What yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> overstep or say anything too much about his projects, but we did have yeah. a, a, a solid conversation. I've seen some of his animals that are pretty unbelievable. So, you know, I like, you know, I do like Exanthics. Um, I'm waiting a little bit till I get on that train, but mm. Sable's, and pixels they're they're sick i think they're awesome yeah. um you know the sable lilies the super sable lilies i mean that stuff's amazing i i just you know pixels mm, I'm just, <laughs> <Not I'm quite. laughs> yeah, dan didn't convince you yet <laughs> i think they're really cool uh i don't know oh, aj you weren't there harry did you get to see the little um I, it was the it was either i don't think it was the pic, super pixel i think it was the pixel yeah 
at he had on his table at yeah. Florifauna. I mean, that yeah. thing was amazing. When you see it in person, I mean, that was a really cool animal. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen enough in person to like <clears throat> super, be super sold on them yet. But again, sure. I'm just like, so I'm you're not sure. you're not going to work on them yet. You're but you're keeping no. I'm going to let Dan them. do that right now, <laughs> and then I'll let him figure it out. So I think oh that one right there, that top left, he has it pinned. Yeah. This yeah. One. That's that so cool. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it is cool. I mean, it comes. I mean, it, it kind of matches your coloration too in terms of the tangerines and whatnot. That's right? probably so, why I gravitate towards that one specifically. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, I'm dealing with this right now, where I'm breeding. <laughs> super softs to softs and getting offspring how are you determining when you're hitting super soft juvies mm. totally out of so, that out of that combo super yeah. soft to soft so obviously you know everything is soft but you how are you determining what's super soft out of those parents <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what is my handy dandy microscope. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a microscope. Um, so no, I mean, all joking aside, that's a really good question. I think a lot of people have that exact same question. Um, yeah. I know I get asked that a lot from just, you know, people who are wanting to work with soft scales or have acquired an animal that's a possible super soft scale, that type of a thing. Um, I, you know, Dan and I have talked at length about this. And then, you know, I've had some conversations with Anthony from Little Monsters. That, that is a tough question because unless you're willing to grow all of your animals out to a significant size to where you can really use the microscope, you know, it comes mm -hmm. down to looking for those visual differences. I think that for me, because I'm, I'm a little bit OCD, um, mm -hmm. I really, I really need to know for some people, they're totally fine saying, you know, this is a super soft, or I mean, this is a soft scale possible super, you know, looking at it as a 10 gram baby. If you're growing it out to see which ones are super, so you can keep them, you know, you're going to have to grow them out to 15 grams yeah, and, and 15 to 20 grams and potentially be willing to look at them under a microscope. I know there's a few breeders out there who will argue with me on that and say that, you know, you can see it. It's not worth it. It takes too much time. That's really a choice you have to make, you yeah. know? I mean, so I think you like can definitely visual see the difference between soft scale and normal. Totally. But <clears throat> soft to the super is tough. Yeah. Mm. Soft to super is tough. But sure. I mean, to be completely honest, if you get to 15, 20 grams, you'll, you'll see it. Visually. Yeah. It's, it's pretty obvious yeah. once they're bigger, but like what I'm dealing yeah. with right now is like all of my stuff that I know is confirmed from super soft like a super soft animal to a soft obviously everything's at least soft scale right. but you know you it's one of those things where i agree with you like you don't really know unless you microscope them at a big enough size where you can look at their head scalation yeah like it's, and I, it's yeah tough. and i think the hard part is for people who are you know like myself who are really diving into this project is like what breeders are willing to do that and to what extent because mm. if we are i think that furthers the legitimacy of the genetic yeah and i think for me i love the idea of people taking the time to do that um but at the same time i get that people are breeding mm. in quantities where sometimes that's not realistic you know mm. um and that's tough and i think if you're going to sell a baby that's 10 grams or less and you're not super confident you know, you really can't call it a super soft scale. Yeah. You, you can just say at that point, you're just selling them as soft, possible, possible. super soft, possible, yeah. super soft. I see. Cause I've seen, soft. I've seen AC do that a lot too, where he sells yeah. things as soft, possible, super soft. Right. And then you grow them to 25 grams and you're like, holy moly, this is absolutely 100% a super soft scale. Yeah. Um, or it, it, it's not. And you're like, this is a really nice animal, but I don't think it's a super. And whether you decide to microscope it then or not, it depends on your projects and your, you know, yeah. you know, your level of commitment to that specific genetic. Yeah. So Good what question. for people that don't um, know or haven't had any experience with it, what are you looking for when you're putting them under the mi microscope? Yeah. When you're lo looking for a super soft scale, what are you determining based on when you're looking at it, what determines um, whether it's a soft or super soft? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for me and Dan as well, because we we kind of do this side by side and hopefully we'll be able to add a lot of, you know, 
the samplings that we've been doing and all the pictures we've been taking over the last year and a half to some of the renovations that uh, Anthony from the Little Monsters is doing on his project um, to, mm. you know, for his book, because we might be able to add a lot of our information to that to kind of help get that out to everybody. But um, the biggest thing is where you're looking at the scales. There's, I feel like for me, a lot of people will send me pictures of laterals, dorsal, mm. you know, pinning. And I'm like, you know, there's so much variation in those scales that it's it's not necessarily um, beneficial to look in those spots. You mm. can have an animal that's not a soft scale have, you know, scales on the sides that look spaced out or, or more appear more flat. Now you have, you know, Chase's stuff that's very rough. He's calling it his, is it boba, boba line? Rough scale. <laughs> rough scale. Okay. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, when I'm taking my photos, I'm taking them on the top of the head between the widest part of the head, the widest mm. part of the breasts on the head Yeah. for consistencies, you know, sake, mm. There's too much variation in my opinion on this, the scales otherwise. Um, and then within that, and I would, oh, I wish I would have had some of these pictures I could have, you know, brought on to this podcast. Yeah. You, have to, you should have taught me how to screen share. Cause I have all this literally right here. Maybe you can tell me how, and I can pull it up. Is it, um, is it, is it, nothing's on your public page though, is it? I haven't posted anything. Cause I, oh, okay. more than anything, I want to get all the information out to everybody before I just okay. start. If you uh, DM me, well, DM me, we can pull it up real quick. Okay. Hold on. Let me DM <laughs> you. Um, anyways, yeah. as I'm DMing you, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you um, a microscopic picture of a super soft scale. Okay. Okay. To start here. Um, and then I can pull up one of a normal. Okay. So I'm sending you this picture here. Send you a couple just for, oh, wait, that wasn't the one. Don't pull that up. Stand by. Okay. okay. So, so you're, looking, you're looking for super, um, super soft or the soft scale on the crest on the head. Not yeah, so that's where I'm taking control. the pictures. Yep. So, you know, if you talk to AC or you talk to Anthony from Little Monsters, you know, everything tracks. It's basically you're looking at the separation of the scales. The scales appear flatter. Um, then the spacing between the scales is actually larger. So I'll pull this here. I'll send, I send you those pictures okay. of the super soft scale. Let me. My, uh, my DM says use the latest version to see this type of message. It's oh, my web so browser. So maybe oh, it's not, it might not be working. Nicoletta. So. All right. That's all right. I'll post it later for everybody, okay. but, yeah, we'll post it um, but basically if you, if you look at the scales, you can <laughs> see on a normal crested gecko that has, you know, the normal, we call normal scales, you know, their scales are right next to each other. They're butted up like this. Okay. In mm. a consistent pattern. Right. Um, in a super soft scale, you see in under the microscope, these scales start to separate and there's a very, very visible gap between the scales on all mm. sides, you know, stacked this way, stacked this way here. Um, the scales can be big, they can be smaller, but you see this this large space between the scales, and it's very very apparent. It's not it's not a oh I think I see spacing, I don't think I see spacing. It is mm. very you know very significant, very very easy to see under a mm. microscope. Where it gets muddled is you know when you're looking at a normal versus a soft or a soft versus a super, and the patterns that we're consistently seeing for us, which I don't know if they track consistently with the, what Anthony Caponetto or Anthony. Um, Vasquez is looking at, but for us, you know, the soft scale, you're seeing some of that spacing, but you're also seeing variation in the shape of the scale, the size of the scale. Mm -hmm. And it almost just looks like a lot, a muddled mess. So um, from, yeah. from soft to super, it, that's what the difference is. Yeah. The soft you're seeing like different size scales, the spacing is there, but it's not significant. There's, okay. you know, okay. variations in patterns and the size of the scale. You might have a big scale next to a small scale. Yeah. And then when you go back to super, you have a much more consistent pattern with significant spacing between the scales. Do you feel mm -hmm. like, so when I've looked at them, um, when I've done, when I've microscoped them, I've seen on like a normal or a soft scale, you have, there's large scales, large, they're all small, but there's large scales and then there's like filler scales, right? right? Filler so there's scale, like yeah. primary scale and then like a filler scale in yep. between the primary scales. Yes. And so by the time you hit that super soft, the filler scales are, are so small or like, I mean, you, you can't even barely see them anymore. I mean, yeah. you may have on some pictures, you may see a little bit of that line between the filler scales, like barely, Yeah. but it's, you know, it's still separated or between those bigger scales that are separated um, on the soft scale, you see, you still see a ton of those filler scales on a soft scale. Yeah, yeah. It's is just that, that a good, is that a good description where it's like primary scale and like a filler scale, yeah, or a filler micro scale, scale or yeah. little triangle, star, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, yeah. 
And that what's really cool about that is when you get to the super soft scale, it is so apparent. And that's, mm, you know, okay. that is, I, I wish I had the picture for you guys, but I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll send them to you so you can post them later. Okay. Or whatever. Um, and I would love, you know, Dan and I both want to get some of these pictures out, but we, you know, want to work with Anthony as well, just to make sure that that's cohesive to well, them. Post like one. That, I'll post one. Like one. Yeah. <laughs> and it aligns, it aligns with the pictures he's posted in the past too. Um, yeah. And on his page, but really, truly, when you're looking at it under a microscope, there is a very definitive, super soft scale. If you question that based on filler scales or separation of the scales, you're probably looking at a soft scale. Yeah. And that's what, you know, that's what I've determined within my collection. Same with Dan, um, Gecko Harmony. And, you know, we've been sold so super soft scales that are soft scales and vice versa. Yeah. I mean, it's just it happens and you know, we can't all be a hundred percent positive, but for me, when I'm looking at my pairings and furthering this genetic, I mean, I sure as heck want super soft scales. Yeah. You know, that's important. Yeah. Cause then, you, cause then you know that everything coming out is soft. <laughs> right. Or if I'm pairing super to super. Yeah. All super. You know? Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, Man, soft scale is one of those things that's, I feel like it's kind of the wild west right now. Oh, what I was going to say, I wish it wasn't named soft scale. It's kind of a bad descriptor. It is. You know, I wish but, I could just go back to AC and be like, could you name it like, I will re say, reduce scale or something? <laughs> I think, you know, this whole idea of like the gecko feeling like velvet, I mean, that holds true to a super soft scale. Some people are like, I feel a super soft scale feels exactly the same. Or I have some animals that feel that soft, but they're not super soft scale. And I'm like, have you looked at them under a microscope? Maybe they are. I don't know. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I do feel like they do feel different to the mm -hmm. touch. Are you touch blind too? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am. I don't, I don't know what I'm touching. I no, but I agree with you guys, I don't have any fingers. <laughs> no, but I agree with you as far as like talking about what the genetic actually is doing to the scales, soft yeah. scale is it is confusing. And I, yeah. you know, I think that is tough. And you know, I think the hardest part for me, you know, focusing on this project specifically is that you, there are a lot of soft scales out there. So, you know different wholesalers that breed soft scales, different people who didn't know they had a super soft scale and things like that. And so yeah. I'm super passionate about really refining my projects so that I can be hundred percent certain for those who want to get into projects using the soft scale that my super soft scales are 100% super soft scales. Yeah. Also with that being said, have some information for people that are new to soft scale or want to get into soft scale who may have an animal in their collection that could be a super soft scale or a soft scale to definitively say, yeah, this is a soft scale, or yes, this is a super soft scale, because it is incredibly frustrating when you see an animal that you know there's something different about it, and you don't have this concrete ability to say, this is a super soft scale, because it doesn't trace back to AC lines, or Nicoletta lines, or Dan Foley lines, or whoever's working with soft scale, you know? And so I, I would love to have the ability to give other people the tools to figure that out in their collection, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. Like being an authority, like doing the work to become an authority figure on a gene where people really do trust when you sell something as, as a soft scale or a super soft, like people trust that. I think that's a really good business play, a really good, like just reputation to build. So that's awesome. I mean, that's, you're doing the work to do that. So that's cool. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, um, what are the main things, if you were going to actually boil down, what are your main projects? I'd love to just hear if you were going to just list them out, obviously soft scales and everything you have tangerine and a bunch of stuff, but if you're going to say like five projects, eight projects, like what would you kind of like bullet point out? If you're going to say like my business is, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, like as far as the, the stuff you're breeding, Crested Gecko wise, Gene wise. Yeah, for sure. Um, so obviously, you know, soft skill, we know that's in everything. Um, one of my main focuses, I call it my white velvet project. Um, and that is to look at some of the animals like yourself, AJ, um, and Harry, I'm not hundred percent sure what your main focus is. I know you have a lot of different things going on. AJ white, yeah, white, uh, high, yeah, so you like the white, white stuff. stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, looking at some of these projects that are far removed from what a super soft scale is right now, high whites um, and these amazing white animals, and then bringing the super soft scale into that and seeing what it does. Can we keep that amazing white that you have? Can we clean it up? I don't know. Tricolors, mm -hmm. you know, really honing in on what can soft scale and super soft scale do to a tricolor and that, that white, that's a super big passion of mine brought into that is the lily whites. So looking at mm -hmm. what is, what am I able to do with the super soft scale against all of these white patterned animals and how can we make that even better? That's one of my fun projects. Um, reds. I have a, a huge obsession obsession with reds. Um, I think reds are underrated in a sense because people get red animals, they breed them together and then they get this brick red and then they don't like it anymore. Um, and so I have been able to produce some really amazing reds that are bright red, um, different from that, you know, muddled red look. And in the last two years, three years, really, I've kind of honed in on what that looks like. And I haven't really sold many of my reds because because of that reason and just perfecting my craft. Um, so reds is a huge, huge project. Are you um, doing reds outside of lily whites or only within lily whites? Both. Okay. Yep. And so what would you say is the way that you pull the mud out? So for me, every red animal that I've paired to a red animal, I get mud red. Um, every mm -hmm. nice red animals coming out of a red to a lavender pairing or a mm. red to a dark base. Really? Mm. Yeah. Red to yellow gets me orange. I like that. Yeah. Once in a while you get a nice red. Um, but it's funny because, you know, Sriracha, the, the really bright red um, girl, the lily up top, she has a really beautiful red lily dad and her mom is lavender. And that's what really kind of started me off onto this, this trek of like how do i reproduce this red this is a different red it's it's yeah. it's bright, bright. It's clear. Yeah. um you know mm -hmm. and and i kept all of her red sibling i mean i have every single red sibling of hers that looks like that um and mm -hmm. then this year kind of pulling out some of the reds that i produced in 2021 and breeding them back and really getting some really nice reds but i think that overall for me that's definitely that's definitely a big heart project for me is reds. I, I mm. love reds for sure. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. I think I think reds need to come back to the spotlight as far as popularity. They've kind of had a little bit of a break, but I think it's time for reds to shine again. I agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wasn't super, super keen on um on yellows until I started producing them myself. And then I was like, oh, I do like yellows. This is really like this is a yeah. really, you know, cool. Um, color as well. So really for me, everything bright is good. Um, so yeah, I think I answered your question maybe. Yeah. No, that's yeah. good. Tangerines, reds, um, super Dalmatians and ink spots. I love the red spot animals. Um, I get it. I got to throw this in just for, for Dan. He asked, uh, how you, how you came up with those big, big crest. <laughs> big oh, headed geckos. <laughs> oh, what is well, your secret? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, stacking yeah, that, I, stacking that trait. I have had some crazy, amazing, like structured geckos. I, I just, none of them have left me, thank God, because um, I can just keep keep breeding them into projects. But I have a big joke with Dan that I, they all have the big heads because I kiss all of my geckos on the head, and that is true. <laughs> I do That's give a secret. Them Every day you kiss, kiss them good night. Right Every day, good night. <laughs> Yeah, right, right on top of the head, and then, uh, and, and then I, it works. She yeah, kisses their works. head, and then she puts them under the microscope and takes a picture of their head. Kiss, and then <laughs> microscope, and then put them to bed. Yeah, no, it's funny because he had a he had a gecko, um, like a whole cell gecko. We were laughing about how poorly structured the head was, and he's like, "Can you just give her a kiss good night?" <laughs> like, sure, no problem. We'll just, um, you know, I love I love my geckos. They're oh. They have my heart, but yeah, I, that's another big part of my projects in that I am weeding out anything with poor head structure. Mm. I, I just, I want that to be a signature of mine that, you know, whatever you get, you get this nice robust structured head and, yeah. and wide dorsal and, and 
quality animal. That's like that's like AJ. A lot of AJ stuff. I, I have several AJ things, and all his, the structure of the head, the crest is so. It's, it's definitely it makes a can, big difference. You know, it's different. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the really thing, is. the thing that's kind of so for a lot of years, obviously, I, I've worked on that, and then the past like two years, I'm starting all these new projects where I bought yeah. animals from other places, oh, no. and I'm yeah. like, these heads suck, <laughs> and it it's it's kind of bumming me out. But at the same time, I have to think like I've done this before. You have a few generations, and I, you'll be not fine. even a few. Head structure is pretty fast. Like Mine people don't too, realize. Honestly. Like yeah. I think it's like two generations. You can pretty much turn them around so well that's like with the caps and some of these other you know other animals that i mean they're gonna need they're gonna need some restructuring and yeah and that's one of my things with uh, my dalmatian projects is you know i started off with some poorly structured dowels and i've been able to finally get some some dalmatians and super dowels that have these you know really great um heads and just kind of pushing out what doesn't for my projects is important to me because like you aj it's like you, when you start seeing these animals that have that structure next to the animals that don't, it makes you wonder why people are still breeding animals that have that poor structure. Unless, I mean, it's, it's, it's you not know. hard. It's not hard. Guys, here's here's the here's the secret, okay? It's, it's, really, <laughs> it's, like night. it's really it's not that. I can tell you that. Here's the secret. So you breed a pair, say like the goal is super dials, right? Pick the one that has the most spots and the biggest head and only keep those like and sell the rest of them yep. even if it doesn't have the most spots but it has the best head structure like sometimes you have to forego like one Same of the tricks, things yeah. you're going for to work towards another one you know yep. it's like okay it might take me one more generation on the dowel to get it where i want but at least i'm not taking steps backward <laughs> on the head structure i actually on top of that, I had a question from somebody the other day. It was a really good question, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this too, AJ. Yeah. Um, and it was at what at what size can you really start to see that solid head structure? And for me, I mean, really I can see, I can see babies hatch out without yeah the yeah. amazing. Mm. Head. Um, yeah. I posted something, and you know, someone was like, "You can't see it until 20 grams," and I'm like, "Well, That's I've not had animals who've grown into their heads, but I also." I also see it right out of the egg. I mean, they have these noggins that are amazing and the structure mm. is beautiful. The dorsal like is wide. Everything looks good out yeah. of the egg. Not to say that some that don't have that won't grow into it. Almost. But... Yeah. Almost all animals that have wide dorsals have big heads. Mm -hmm. mm. And so that was, a, I think that's probably what helped me for a long time is because I, that was such a focus of mine was like, that get get that dorsal when they first started they were like skinny you know, super and then, skinny like, and then like at the neck narrow yeah at the neck. and then we just like each year you just try to like push it further and further where like mm -hmm. the back is almost wider than it's oh like the the current state of how wide the dorsals are on geckos is so unnatural Amazing. to floppy. like we think it looks normal but like none of them looked like that <laughs> at all like mm -hmm. no gecko came out of the wild with a door like the dorsals are like four times wider than they used to be that's yeah, how I much mean, it, how much of it is genetics versus incubation and temps that cause Ooh. the head, head structure? structure maybe i mean hot incubation definitely hurts it okay but i'd say it's maybe 50 percent. okay so it's quite a bit in terms of incubating so even if you have like some stellar um traits traded animals that have huge heads you you gotta you cook them, them, you cook them hot then yeah. you'll probably end up with like average yeah, uh, I see. Okay. Good. That's my opinion, but I, I don't know. know. I feel like I look at young geckos if I'm looking at something on a table and I'm like, I'm not super convinced what the structure is gonna look like. That that part where they're, you know, the base the bottom of their head meets the dorsal on the back. Mm -hmm. If it's narrow right there, I'm like, Yeah. No, I don't uh, you the know crazy ones. Have you seen the ones where it's so wide and the heads are gonna be so big that they get folds? Yes, they fold. They get, yes. Like their crest where their head meets their neck will be like fold. Like it'll have like you want to like the go skin in. will bunch. The skin will like the, yeah. the pinstripe scales go will bunch up and like lift it up just so you can see <laughs> the potential of it. Yeah. And they'll it's have like a, that as like, like, like hatchlings. Oh yeah, he's wearing a, he's, uh, geckos are wearing hoodies. Pretty yeah. much, but yeah, I think I definitely think you can see it as you know from a young age. Totally, if 100%. you know what you're looking at. So these are like really thick. Thick, uh, oh, go if yeah, you dorsals. if you exit out of that, I'll show you one of my um biggest like recent posts. If you go, let's see, go down just a smidge. 
<laughs> Mac, he's he's one that everybody uh, gives me a heck over because he's just got a huge head. He's coming up here right a little bit far, right there on the right hand side, the red boy. This one? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, it's like so big, it's flopping. Yeah, he's he's just a specimen, that one. Oh, yeah. But you can see right where, you know, his head heads. Dorsal, he's got, it's wide. He's got that nice wide dorsal. Yeah. You know, the, the, the crests on the head are floppy, but his head is like, I mean, his head is just huge. Yeah. There's a yeah, certain cool. amount and people don't realize this. This gecko is not like overweight, but there's a certain amount of head structure that is an animal carrying extra fat. Too. Yeah. His jowls. Um, like jowls. I see a lot of geckos where like, oh, when this gecko is this weight its head looks crazy like mm -hmm. it's so big and then I it loses say, like at the end of a breeding season or whatever i'm like man this thing's got like a normal head you know well, there's a baby here pull that little tangerine baby up right below mm -hmm. there that baby is about three and a half grams yeah you oh can, yeah you know yeah, you can big. see he's yeah his crests are already yeah it's yeah. not even my best example but that's cool yeah that's what's hard when you know I don't know. I think it goes back to like what your intentions are as a breeder and what your goals are and kind of looking past just the, you know, the morphs and things like that into yes. like the structure of the animal. I think that is for me, I would love to tell so many people who message me like, this is my first, you know, I'm just getting into breeding and I bought these four animals and they send me pictures of the animals and I'm like, I don't feel like you can breed them. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, please return those. Yeah, and I would never, I would never ever say that. And please don't I, stop I sending do feel... pictures, people. But yeah, I'm gonna I, send I, you I pictures do... of geckos. You're gonna be like, return, return. <laughs> I do feel like, but I produced these. these. <laughs> <laughs> Garbage. 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 Dismiss. But no, the, I, um, I think that that's like we've talked about. I think we've talked about it before on the podcast, Harry. But I'd almost like lump what we're talking about into like breeding fundamentals like yeah good yeah. head structure mm -hmm. i i don't like geckos that have like those long gator faces mm -hmm. like those long like sharp noses I, i'm like, super interested to see what david does with his you know his um gold standard gecko you know club i think it's an interesting it's an interesting thought on how he's kind of trying to yeah. you know go back to the basics Def and let people define know, what define is it, you know define what is good structure i mean there's so many people who don't even know what we're talking about yep. yeah. when we're talking about yeah. structure and it's like what are you looking at when you're talking about a quality structured animal and mm. then having mm. the ability to show them like poor quality structure good quality and then you've got you know you're over the top like crazy good <laughs> structured animals yeah, but yeah. you that know i think I think the education part is huge because you have a lot of, you have a lot of new people that are coming in to breed. I mean, I'm not oh, yeah. super seasoned, um, but I'm thankful I had mentors to be like, you know what you invest in quality. If you want to be a reputable breeder, if you want to do well and you want to produce good quality animals, you have to invest in quality. You cannot buy a bunch of cheap animals and then expect to produce a lot of good animals. It's just not really how it works. And, you know, I'm thankful I had that guidance, but like going back to just what, what does that even mean? I think would be huge. And that's what I'm excited to see what David does. Cause I mean, hopefully that will standardize some things too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That'll be yeah. interesting. I wonder kind of where he's getting the input, input the input as far as what standard is. And I haven't heard yet, but I don't know, like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's somewhat subjective. I, I have a certain opinion on what, when I look at an animal, like I don't want them to look lanky and long. I don't want them to also look like snub nose where they're like super short faced, but I don't want them like with a gator face where it's like super long, right? crappy head structure, buggy eyes. Like there's certain things where it's like, you just don't want, I don't know. There's certain things that I think are kind of definitively not desirable. Right. Yeah. Um, and maybe we don't realize it, but we just naturally gravitate away from it. Right. Um, well, and I think too, yeah. it's all, you know, and I've talked to David about this too, but I think it, you know, a lot of it is going to come down to like an opinion, but then there's yeah. parts of it that are, they are facts. And it's like, like you said, of talking about structure, quality of the animal, yeah. um, body structure, too. body structure, you, yeah. you know, those yeah. types I, of things. I, I, um, I do think, I do think it'll take a couple of generations of, defining what the standard is for people to finally understand. Cause the, once you pioneer that thing, you're going to get so much hate 
because I was right. like, what about all my entire collection of these right. writers? Prior collection not, sucks. You know? It's very subjective. <laughs> and I think that, you know, David, I do feel like his vision for it is is very cool. And I think that it will evolve into something really great. But I agree with you. And I think, you know, he probably would too, that it's going to take a few years of yeah. putting, you know, putting all this out more. there. Yeah. yeah, and I'll be there. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not like yeah. super competitive with like trying to compete gecko for gecko. Um, so that'll be interesting to see how that goes. But I think it'll be fun, and I think it'll bring attention to the whole, yeah. the whole point. You know, the whole yeah. point of yeah, what I agree. To do. Even, even if people don't like go into the thing trying to compete, I think it makes that conversation to change up for new breeders. What is a good structured animal and they can begin it's to work a conversation it. going and, yeah. you know, yeah, because we have a lot of wholesale animals that with that are really poor, like look at Marf Market is flooded with a lot of like poorly structured animals. And I think the more we have these conversations, the more we'll begin to create better things with all these new breeders coming in. Right. And so, Absolutely. yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so much has changed, right? I mean, it's, it's, I think structure has always been something that has been um, important, but not talked about, right? Like people will, I, I mean, even right now it's, it's crazy how inherently like I'm working with like some exanthic stuff, almost all of the exanthic stuff has horrible head structure, like all of it. That's and true. even when you look over and you like, I have combed Korea, like looking at all of the exanthics produced. I'm like, man, the head structure sucks like across the board. And so it's like, that's a trait where I feel like people prioritized speed and prioritized mm. white, mm -hmm. you know, coverage on the Lily exanthics and stuff where they didn't actually focus on keeping the, the essentials there. Right. Right. So well, now we have to work backwards and, mm -hmm. and do the work on exanthics now that should have been done before but well and i think too if you look at the market i mean a lot of times i think a lot of that is driven by by the investment you're making in an animal like that yeah. and then trying to get your return is you know in a decent time frame and you know with the it being recessive it takes so much longer than a lot of other things and so now maybe with the market being a little bit different Cooler, yeah. it'll get it'll give people the opportunity to hold more things back kind of focus on that and and see yeah. if you can you i'm know, excited for that yeah, I think I think that will be good. You know, caps too. I, I just I would love yeah. to see someone say, okay, enough is enough. Let's let's like perfect this and yeah, make them a little bit better structurally. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Nicoletta, moving talking a little bit about business. Um, yeah. we don't we don't have to dive super deep, but when you got in, you talked a little bit about about it earlier in terms of your other business and uh, Juliana's geckos. Did you have like a business strategy specifically coming into the gecko world where you like, I'm going to be uh, as big as AC or were you just going to be like, let me just see where it goes. What was your mindset coming into the gecko hobby? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think initially it was make a name for myself and what that looked yeah. like was putting together a lot of projects to have a result that I could get out for people to see. Right. Um, not necessarily for the money side of it, but with the investment that I made in geckos, I mean, that was a priority. I had to, I had to mm. make some money, um, yes. or at least recoup some of, of my investment. When you get into the gecko hobby and you, you, you know, you invest into quality, it's not an overnight thing and it takes a lot yeah. of time and the market's volatile. Mm. And so, you know, you know, my initial business plan, it was a hobby project, but when you spend that much money, it has to be a little bit more than that. Um, I think for me, Agreed, yeah. my goals have shifted over time um, okay. as I become more, more passionate about specific things. For example, you know, really honing in on, on my product, which is, you know, we've talked about soft scales, super soft scales, scales all the things we're talking about, right. That's mm -hmm. going to require me to hold back a lot of animals. So making that, you know, making that a, staple in my future has, you know, I've had to shift my business plan. I'm not going to be able to sell as much right now. Mm, um, and, you know, I think that excites me. I think it makes me nervous. I think that it's frustrating a little bit because, you know, ideally I would like to just be cranking out geckos every month, making a ton of money and, you know, all the things that you would start a business to do, but that's not, that's not my goal. Um, 
yeah, refining actually. refining my projects right now is my goal. And yeah, I'm going to let some awesome animals go. And I do have a lot of awesome animals that don't align with my projects that I've accumulated that mm -hmm. probably need to go to someone else's project projects. So I'm kind of trying to make some tough cuts right now. And I have a hard time letting things go. I mean, these animals, I love them. It's not, yeah. it's not just like a turn and flip. <laughs> thing. I wish some days I go through my collection. I'm like, I wish I didn't care so much because some of those tough decisions seemed like they would be easier, you know, mm. but yeah, you know, my business goals now are to refine my product so that going mm. forward, I, you know, I can be the best version of what Juliana's is. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is going to take more time than I thought. Yeah. I think that's interesting, even especially for new breeders to hear this, uh, mm -hmm. that maybe it's going to take three, four years to refine what you want rather than just selling everything off. Right. And I feel mm -hmm. like that is a struggle for me at the moment where like you, I did spend quite a bit of money <laughs> and investment yeah, I buying mean, at the top during COVID. And now here we are. Oh, and, I'm glad. Um, I wish we could like fist pump right now. <laughs> I think, uh, Nicoletta, you and I, we represent a decent amount of people that uh, bought yeah. the COVID yeah. readers. That <laughs> you got a new car. We know why. It's us. I was kidding. Um, <laughs> but so, so, like you, my <laughs> mindset also shifted to be like, okay second year in i'm not gonna make anything third yeah. year in maybe a little bit here and there but i do want to refine what i'm trying to make so how long is that going to take you know is it going to be right. year four year five and so i'm tracking all these breeders um that came in maybe they were about three years in when i came in and they were you know they've been doing really well and i was like is three year the mark you know is four year the mark so mm. it's kind of around there where you begin to try to figure things out and um yeah try to well, I feel well, like Nicoletta's already there. I mean, you're selling animals. Yeah, yes. yeah I'm definitely not not selling animals. I, yeah, you know, that's well, not. Like, yeah, yeah, I do. I do well for for what I, you know, I I don't not make money on on yes. the business side of things. I will say for me, I've had to shift. I, I've hit a a part, or I guess like, what do you call it? I don't know the you a know path, or you've hit I, you've I hit a, a point. A fork in the road. That's what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. Fork in the road. I hit a fork in the road where. I have to, I've had to decide, am I going to be the breeder that has so many animals that I have to start wholesaling them out? Mm -hmm. I've decided that's not for me. Yeah. I don't want to get to a place mm -hmm. where I have so many animals that I have to just start handing them out and wholesaling things, you know, searching for that avenue. That's not what my initial market was. That's not where I wanted to fall into. But when you invest a lot of money, you buy a lot of geckos, you start producing geckos, you're three, four, five years in producing geckos, you have a lot of babies and you look back and you're like, hold on a second. Like, what is my actual capacity? What can I handle physically, you know, care wise? But then what is my intention? What is my goal? And my goal isn't to sell $50 wholesale animals. My goal yeah, is to have yeah. the best version of the animals that I can. <laughs> now, where that falls price wise in the market doesn't necessarily matter. But yeah. I want to have a product that people want, that's consistent, and that aligns with my original yeah. goals and visions. And, you know, this last year, I recognized that when I started making all of these investments and I started breeding, there's a lot of projects that I look at and I don't have a passion for them. Do they make great animals? Absolutely. Do those animals sell? For sure. Is that where I want to take my business? No. So I have to make that, you know, that decision of, letting those things go, being okay with that and being okay with business shifting. And, you know, thankfully mm -hmm. I have a little bit of entrepreneurial background and recognizing that it's okay to shift and morph your original business goals and plans mm -hmm. based off of things, but it's hard, it, you know, and I wish I had someone to tell me back then, like Nicoletta, you don't need every nice mail that you can possibly get. You need the best mails and you need less yeah. of them. I mean, I mm -hmm. think one of the biggest mistakes I made is I just started buying a bunch of stuff that I thought looked cool without having a vision for a specific project. That's what everyone does. Yeah. And I think, and everyone, does that. and then it's like yeah. backtracking now I'm like, wait a second, you know, if I could tell something to the newest breeder out there, it's plan your projects around the mail, mm, yeah. fill that in with your nice females <laughs> and have a vision for your projects. Don't buy animals that are going to produce animals you think are going to sell because that changes yeah. all the time. Yeah, if you yeah, don't yeah. looking at the animals you're producing and you don't get excited about whatever morph or genetic you're working with, it will be like a fleeting ship. You're going to stop caring. And guess what? Dalmatians are super popular now. Maybe not next month. You know, and I'm not saying that's mm. true, but you know what yeah. I mean? It's like that kind of stuff. Everything, comes, everything up and down. Yeah. 
But if you yeah. love looking at it, it won't matter. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you won't, you won't get tired of it. You'll just love making it. Yeah, and, you, ha and you have to, you have to love opening that box and feeding it every day and spraying it. <laughs> it's, yeah, you, and it's, you don't it's like hard. it. <laughs> it's hard when you have the realization that you have 50 geckos that you don't even remember you have. When you start thinking of pairings in your head and you're like, oh, where's my next project? And then you go in your gecko room and you're like, oh, I forgot I had you. I forgot I had you. I forgot I had you. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, that's where like the fork hit. And I was like, this isn't mm. necessarily what I want personally. Now that's yeah. different for everybody, right? So not that I have to remember every single gecko in my collection, but you should have a fire that, you know, and a vision mm. and and stick with it. And, and it is going to morph as new genes happen and new morphs come up. And you're like, you know, I remember when I started, like I said, it was the Halloweens. And I'm like, oh, I love that animal. And then I'm like, oh, I love lavender. Oh, I love red. Oh, I love this. Oh, yeah. I love that. And I love it all. And and um, and it does change. And I think that's it's important to it's important to take your time. Yeah. 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 What what have been the best outlets for you sales wise? Has it been private DMs? Has it been Morph Market? Has it been your personal website? Uh, shows or, or shows? Vending yeah. shows. I know you've been um, vending shows as well. For the high end animals. <laughs> Um, that are, you know, I'm going to say, I'm going to call high end, um, 400 to $2,000 animal. Yeah. Um, I find the best outlet that I've had is people who've seen my animals on Instagram, send me a message and then I direct them to my website. Okay. Um, yeah. I did decide to build a website mainly because, um, I liked the legitimacy of a website. I think for, yeah. you know, the business side of things when you're building, you know, invoicing and, you know, your back end of your business, it's nice to have a website to keep everything in one place, especially with shipping. I mean, everything can be there, which is really cool. Um, so I do, I do utilize my website a lot for that, for the 400 and under <laughs> animals, those go well at shows for me. I'll sell, you know, a few high, you know, 500 to $2,000 animals at shows, but it's, it's not necessarily for me my best sellers here. Now my shows are different than some of the shows you guys are attending. So it really is just going to depend on, um, you know, where, where you're selling, I guess. I mean, I'm not going to some of these bigger, you know, bigger shows and things like that. Oh yeah. There's my website. Um, Morph market. I love morph market for what it is this last year. I've actually been not posting anything to morph market. Mm. Um, mm. I feel like when I was posting to Morph Market, I was getting a lot of, hey, what do the parents look like? And I'm like, they, you know, go to my website. They're there. They're listed with the listing there. You can see all the lineage. Okay, cool. How much? I'm like, again. <laughs> also, you can look at the Morph Market listing. Yeah. Um, and a lot of a lot of ghosting type situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I love common. Morph Market, like I said, but when you have a website, it is mildly tedious to upload everything to your website and then go upload it again to your morph market. Yeah. It's, um, it's hard to do both. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And I would love to, <laughs> like, I would love to be able to do that and have like the wherewithal. And sometimes I do and, and I'll have them on both platforms and, you know, I have sold animals on morph market. Don't get me wrong, but it is a, it is a little bit muddled on there because you get lost. Like you said, on some of these wholesale ish animals and people are like, mm. why is your gecko two grand next to this Lily white? That's 200. And you're like, well, let me yeah. give you the five reasons, but then they're not going to buy. They don't that. care. Yeah. They don't, you know, they don't care. <laughs> no, it's just, it's just harder. And I feel like the yeah. higher end stuff, people are valuing who you are, what your you know projects are. And they're the ones who are going to send you a private message and say, Hey, I want your tangerine. How can I get it? And yeah. then those usually turn into your best sales. I think, I think having a website, AJ, do you have a website? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I need, I need to rebuild it right now, but I've had one for probably like seven years, the same one. I think it's super valuable. I mean, I, yeah. for me it is. And then obviously, you know, Instagram is the social platform that I use. Oh, there it is. Um, for my, my social side of things. Cause I don't, I don't have a lot of social platforms. Um, besides Instagram, I just not a tech person, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nicoletta, in, uh, in terms of the community aspect of the hobby, what's your take on the gecko community? Is it a positive force? Is it toxic? Where do you land? Do you enjoy engaging um, with people or are you, are you staying pretty low key like um, a lot of other breeders as well? Where do you stand? Also, yeah. are you are you in our Discord or not? <laughs> I will be. Shout out to our Discord people. You want to I join? I didn't know what Discord was. And now that I know, 
I will get on there and I will I will be yes. on the Discord. I absolutely will. Discord. You can um, Historically, you can Discord is for nerds and people who like video games. <laughs> okay, but, but we're now on it's for gecko nerds. nerds as well. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I love the gecko community that I've built. I am a non-drama person. I've always been that way. I'm very straightforward. You kind of will always know where you stand with me. If I have a question, I'll ask. If I have a problem, I'll talk to you about it. I don't do well with kind of this like social blow up of situations and then having all these people chime in. I tune out of that personally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, neither here nor there, it's totally up to you if you want to engage in that or be a part of it or share it. And that's all well and good. But I, I do tend to shy away from that type of stuff in the community. Um, I value people's opinions a lot. And typically in those situations, I find myself reaching out to people if I feel like I need information directly. Um, but for the most part, I tend to just stay out of it. And I don't know. But I, I mean, is the community toxic? It's toxic if you let it be, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to engage in the toxicity of it, then yeah, it's, it's going to be a super toxic environment. But that's every industry. That's not the reptile industry, yep, you know, yep, that's, yeah. that's everywhere. And every single thing. Just, yes. It, yeah. Agreed. It's not like you can escape it by exiting this industry and going to something else. It just is yeah. what it is. Yeah. But I think, you know, staying out of the drama and personally, if you have an issue with something or someone, you know, I have just been a direct head on, hit it where, you know, you need to and move on privately. I, I just have, you'll never yeah. see me like, and I've had, you know, things happen where I've, had a hard time with something and I will communicate with that person and then put it to bed. I mean, I just, but I also yeah. have kids. I'm, you know, it's just a I lot think, changes once you have kids. Yeah, like I, I agree. Got, I a agree with this. Yeah. Like Harry, Harry sent me, did you send me that thing the other day? That real Harry <laughs> it's where it's like yes. before you have kids, like, <laughs> yeah. like, I, I don't know. Is it, he's, to engage in drama. Yeah. Like, and then after it's no. like, I don't care at all. No. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I give zero apps. I give yeah. zero apps. Yeah. Like I'm totally over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's how yeah. I feel that's already. I'm like, I don't have time. I don't have time for this. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, and you have to have your network of close people, you know, that you can text yeah. and be like, oh my gosh, did you see this post? What in the f? You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You have, to have yeah. your people and, me and, and keep them close. And yeah, yeah, I mean, you have. I mean, mine is Dan with Gecko Harmony and and Kenny awesome. with Buckeyes Guys Morphs, and you know, you have your yeah, people Kenny you text you. and be like, yeah. what on earth is happening? And then you laugh about it, and then you move on. And then you move on, yeah. And then you yeah. move on, and it's like, or if it's something that's you know. You have the people that'll build you up. Holy crap, this sucks, you know, whatever. And, you know, mm -hmm. I don't post that stuff. You would never know if I, you know, had something, you know, happen or that need. I just don't talk about it. So, yeah, yeah, same. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't air out your dirty laundry publicly. But no, I love this community. I think this community is amazing. Yeah. I think you guys are awesome. You know, Harry coming yeah. up with this idea of, of bringing yeah, the community together. Yeah, this both way. AJ and I. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, and AJ, yeah. I mean, you guys both have a vision for this that I think, you know, this is where the gecko community should be. And I, when I first started in the industry, there's not a lot of people who wanted to tell me much of anything. I'm yeah. not that type of person. Like, I've never been that type of person. If I'm yeah. going to learn something, I usually learn it the hard way. And then I usually tell everybody around me because that's just the type of person I am. And I felt like that was like this sealed kind of like, Oh, don't, don't tell anybody you're, you're the, the good things about what's going on because what if they start doing it and then they start having good things happen? It's like, I just feel like that that sucks and that's where the toxicity comes in. So that's yeah. what's really cool about, you know, fostering an environment where people can ask questions. And yeah, the old school mentality of like gatekeeping info. That's like if you're a new if you're like a a, a good business, that concept is dead. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be a teacher and you have to be somewhat of an open book yeah absolutely. you know in in this day and age mm -hmm. a lot of people aren't um but like i i just think about like just this week i've had so many i've had like five people dm me this week like hey where do you buy those square deli cups and like <laughs> in the past because i use these square deli cups and in the past i would be like hey you know maybe i don't tell everybody but now I'm like, screw it. I'm just sending everybody the link. I'm like, go ahead, buy them. I don't care. Yeah, I do that too. Like, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. like you just yeah. have to be, you have to be, I don't you, know. Like, you know, we might as well just help people. Like, why not? What's interesting, AJ, is that 
as a new reader, as I was buying stuff, if people like withheld information and people know when you do, right? If you withhold information, I'm just going to go to the next person, right? Yeah. It's, it's, totally. it's literally, you have to be a hub uh, where people can trust you, where they know that you're looking out for them and you're not competition, right? Yeah. Yep. So if you have that competitive mindset, I'm 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 going to try to keep my circles kind of away yeah. from that. So. Yeah, and then you you're never going to trust that person. You don't want to buy from them. You know? Well, like, it just it's an insecurity thing. And yeah, yeah. you know, confident people can you see that from a mile away and yeah. you know, people want to listen to confident people and and it takes it takes people that are confident to teach other people how to be confident. And that's yeah. that's what I don't understand is like <laughs> It's, it's, but I'm it a seems, coach. And, seems I mean, like I've common sense, right? My entire life, I've always been a like cheerleader and like let me tell yeah. you all the way. So yeah. that's just in me. That's um, not natural to everyone, but no, I it think is. it is. I think some people have to discipline themselves to to put that into practice, and others it comes naturally. But if you're going to be in business, especially one that's as tight knit as this, yeah, you yeah, have to helpful. be. You have to be like a collaborator, and you have to be yeah. somebody that's helpful. <laughs> well, and I think it's important to have boundaries as a business owner too. I mean, yeah. it goes both ways. You have, you'll have people that'll ask you so many questions that it sucks the life out of you. And it's like, yeah. you have to determine at what point do I cut this off? You know? And I had, I had someone message me <clears throat> just to this point the other day and, and they're like, Hey, so-and-so sent me your way. I think, I think they got sick of my question. <laughs> like, okay. I said, well, you know, what are they? And I got into it with them and it was, it was nothing that big. It was just, you know, a few things I, to help answer them. And they're like, you know, I think I want to buy from you. And that person just kind of mm. told me that yep. I was asking too many questions and now I feel confident and, you know, and it turned into a sale. Yeah, so yeah, it's, just, cool. it, it's, we, we have a solution for that too. Just send them to our discord. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Here's the link. You want to talk? It's literally a hub where everyone's helping each other. So I, I love that. Great. I <laughs> yeah. love that. It's just a giant, like, uh, yeah, it's just a giant, like help group. <laughs> I love it. That's amazing. So Nicoletta, we're going to wrap up, but I want to ask you, I guess, what is, if you're going to give what your like top tip for a new breeder would be, what would that be? Question A. And then uh, question B, where can people find you, uh, engage with you, buy from you, all of that? Okay. Yes. Did you want to ask me about husbandry in Colorado? We can talk later. I don't think we have time, but okay, we'll talk I later. will talk. Yeah. We've yeah. got to chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I already forgot your first question. There uh, tip tips for new breeders. Okay, if you're going to, yes, yeah, yes. if you're going to give a couple. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing that I learned the hard way is, and I think I went over this a little bit when you're planning your projects, find the best male and plan mm -hmm. your project around that. Yes with yeah. some really nice females. Not to say you shouldn't get nice females, that's not what I'm saying, but I have seen a lot of people who invest in subpar males for really, really nice females. And I myself have done that. And I feel mm -hmm. like it sets your project back, projects back a lot, um, mainly mm -hmm. because that male is gonna be pushed into a few females and it's kind of the staple of whatever the project is that you're doing. So when you're yeah. starting out, you're investing in quality animals, <laughs> you know, invest in a quality male and people want to skimp on it because they're, you know, you can find males everywhere. Females are harder to come by. So they think, oh, I need to have the nicest, best females. And I got to spend all this money on females. But if you don't have a nice male, none of that matters. Yeah. So that's, you know, one big thing for me um, as far as kind of building your projects. Um, as also being a new breeder, I mean, ask questions, be willing to be patient. I think that for me, I learned the hard way. I was very impulsive and mm -hmm. everything I saw I had to have and anything that someone was like, well, I'll give you a deal. I'm like, okay, it's a great deal. Do your research, do your homework, take your time, ask questions, talk to reputable breeders. You know, it doesn't always have to translate into a sale when you're asking questions. And I think heading that up with, hey, I'm not looking to buy right now, but I'm starting these projects. Do you have any insight for me? Um, at least we know then that you're not looking to buy and we can help you you know, in that way, go to that discord. Um, I didn't ask a lot of questions. I just bought a lot mm. of stuff and was like, Oh, what do I do now? Um, structure, structure. It's all about structure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. All right. all right. So where can everybody find you? Where, where would you like to engage with folks? Um, what um, shows do you have coming up? All that good stuff. 
yeah, this, this year I did a lot of out of state shows. I will not be doing that next year. Um, mainly just because I'm busy. The only social media platform I'm active on is Instagram. I have a Facebook page, but I am very inactive on my Facebook page. Um, hardly ever check it. So if you want to get in touch with me, um, Instagram is the place. I don't foresee having any other social outlets ever. So that's probably where I'll stick around. My website is a great place. You can um, submit you know, questions on there. And then I also do a monthly newsletter if you subscribe to my website. And I oftentimes, yeah, I oftentimes will give out um, discount codes to my email subscribers, which is kind of fun. Especially how do you, how do you get to your uh, newsletter? So if you go to Juliana, just click on Juliana. Oh, here. Okay. Yep. And then it'll say right there and you just oh, enter your, your kids. Right That's cute. Yeah. They're, they were younger there, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, you just enter your email there, hit join. I get that. And then going forward, um, you know, you'll get my newsletter and then those discount codes that I send out. And, um, and that's probably the two, the two biggest places shows wise, you know, Flora Fauna, I will be there. If you Yay. haven't made it to Flora Fauna and you <laughs> love geckos and you want to be a breeder or you are a breeder and you want to network, I mean, there is no better place to meet and network with gecko mm. people, geek out, see some of the most amazing animals you'll ever see. Um, and you know, so I will, I will make an appearance at Flora Fauna. Otherwise I'll be sticking around Colorado next year, um, cool. for Colorado Expos. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see you in New York. York. Yeah. At Flora Fauna. Yeah. Yes. I'll be vending at Flora Fauna. I might make it to Tinley to see everybody, ah. um, next year. <laughs> I would really year. love to do that, but you should go um, to March. Yeah. If you're going to, or sorry, you should go to October. If you're going to go to October. Anywhere. Okay. Okay. A lot That's of people good. don't go to March. Okay. That's good to know. Mm. Yeah, from a That's social right. standpoint, October is the one to go to. Have you okay. been to Tinley before? Uh, I haven't. Okay. No, I actually my first NARBC show that I I attended this year I actually vended at, and that was the Schomburg show. Um, and it was a nice it was a nice show. I just I I don't foresee myself traveling much next year. It's just yeah. too hard. It's a yeah. lot. It's a lot on it, animals too, for sure. Yeah, it is. And, and I have Mike. Well, I mean, that's not to say you might not see some of my animals at shows because my manager, Mike, he'll be doing a lot of shows on the road. So uh, okay. I oftentimes send animals with him, but me physically won't be at, at much yeah. more than Colorado. So cool. So we'll see you in New York. Yep. Um, or if we come to Denver. If you come and, to Denver. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thanks thank for you, hanging out so with us. Fun. Thank you, Nicoletta. That was awesome. I appreciate you so much. Yeah. You're awesome. Yeah. yeah we'll do it again. It was yep, amazing. We'll, do it again. we'll chat more later. Perfect. Thank See you. you guys. All right. Thanks.